Good evening. I've had a strange week with regard to electronics. Everything I touch just works differently from what it ever did before. And I'm seeing things up here I've never seen. So this is number five in See what I mean? <laughs> there we go. This is number five in a series of nine on uh, lessons preached from outlines of preachers of the past. All of these are archived on my YouTube channel, and you probably can't read that there, but if you go to YouTube, you can actually go directly to my channel from, by youtube.com, stroke, little letter C, stroke, Alpar underscore CTC, but you can just go search my name and get there. It's a lot easier to remember. The uh, outline for this particular lesson is found in Gus Nichols' sermons. Uh, Gus Nichols' sermon outlines published by Nichols Brothers Publishing Company, 1962, page 32. Gus Nichols was born in a log cabin near Carbon Hill in Walker County, Alabama, January 12, 1892. He did not have the opportunity to obtain much formal schooling. At the age of 12, he had to drop out of school to help support the growing family. His father, William Calvin Nichols, uh, quote, set him free, unquote, on his 20th birthday, and the next day, Gus went back to school. The oldest of 10 children, he was the first in the house to obey the gospel. In 1908, at the age of 17, Gus Nichols was baptized into Christ. In 1913, he married Matilda Francis Brown. He supplemented his income by farming and working in a coal mine 12 hours a day at $1 per day. He preached his first sermon in August of 1919 in a rural community schoolhouse. The same year, with a wife and three children, he enrolled in Alabama Christian College then located at Barrie, but most of Gus Nichols' education was achieved through private study. He was an avid reader who accumulated a vast library. He preached in at least 17 states, holding meetings for some of the largest churches of Christ in the nation. In the 1960s, he received about 300 calls per year, and of those, he preached 8 to 10 meetings per year. He averaged 15 to 18 sermons and classes each week including a daily 30-minute radio program. Under his preaching, according to his son Flavel, over 12,000 people were baptized. Brother Nichols authored six books. At least three collections of his sermons were published. For 42 years, he conducted annual training classes from which went countless church leaders. Several dozens of men became full-time gospel preachers due to his direct influence. The spirit and work of Gus Nichols lives on in the work of others he continues to influence through his still-remembered reputation and his books and audio recordings. The sermon that I have chosen for this hour from that book is How to Make the Church Strong. God wants the church to be strong. He wants the church to be strong in every community. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth in the 16th chapter of the first letter. And he said in verse 13, Watch, you stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. And to the Colossians, Paul wrote in chapter 1 of that a brief epistle and beginning in uh, verse number 5, Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse number 5, Paul wrote, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, and the word of the truth of the gospel, which is coming to you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you, since the day that you heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. As you also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. 
For this cause also, we, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power and all patience and long suffering, with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father. God wants the church to be strong. The church should be strong, as strong as possible numerically. We should seek to evangelize all the people of our community. That is the work of the church assigned by the Lord from the very beginning and was the practice of the church under the direction of the apostles as they lived from the very beginning. The very first gospel sermon that was ever preached in so far as the written record con uh, is concerned was that of Peter uh, in Jerusalem as recorded in Acts chapter 2 where uh, beginning in verse number 36 we read these familiar words let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified both Lord and Christ now when they heard this they were pricked in their heart, and they said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. And when they heard that, they, uh, they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. The last verse of that chapter says that the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. When the gospel of Christ is preached, there will be people who hear it, who believe it, and who will act upon it. They will turn from their sins. They will ask to be baptized into Christ so that they might rise to walk in newness of life. Certainly not everyone will. Not everyone ever did. Perhaps in some small community, in some situations, that might be the case. But typically, uh, we don't expect that. But the fact that everybody doesn't does not indicate that nobody will. Uh, we should always preach the gospel to every soul. That's the commission of the Lord. And those who... Uh, do hear it, believe it, and uh, act upon it are those folks who are saved. The church should be strong morally and spiritually. Each member should be strong in the Lord. As Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus again, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We could do well to study some of these specific words and what they mean and how, and what they're, how they're used in their various contexts. But it's clear from an overview that God wants the church to be strong. How do you make the church strong? The Bible does not leave us in ignorance. God hasn't left us in ignorance. The Bible is his word to us, and it is an instruction manual for the church and for the life of every Christian. God gives us very specific points on how to make a church strong strong as he wants it to be. We might begin by recognizing that we've, we've got to lay the foundation of filling the church with a knowledge of God's word. We are not the church of Christ if we, don't under, if we don't know and understand the word of Christ and build everything else upon that word. In Acts chapter 20 verse 32 says, And now brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. If they followed the word, Paul talking there to the elders in the church in Ephesus, if they followed the word, they would be built up, made stronger, strengthened in Christ, matured in Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 2, our brother wrote, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. How do we make the church strong? We teach the word of God. We fill the church with a knowledge of God's word. I don't know about you, but I suspect uh, that uh, if I uh, limited my Bible study to uh, two or three 40-minute sessions a week, you would not think that was satisfactory for a preacher. 
I wonder how it can be satisfactory for a Christian. To how can we know the Word of God? How can we be filled with the knowledge of the Word of God if we limit our Bible study to the time we spend together in this room? We can't do it, really. We've got to be people who pay attention to God's Word every day. Brother Nichols suggested Bible schools, regular preaching, VBS, gospel meetings, radio, TV, tracts, home libraries, church library, cottage meetings, etc. as sources of our study uh, opportunities for our learning more of the Word of God. And if he had lived in our generation, I'm sure he would have added direct mail, email, websites, blogs, and other social media. That's just the kind of man that Brother Gus Nichols was. He educated himself, and he studied books from many, many sources. The uh, Holy Spirit tells us in Hebrews chapter 5, you can read, beginning in verse number 12, when for the time you ought to be teachers... Ye yeah, have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. That's not a compliment, brethren. He was scolding them for not having grown to the ability to be teachers. Uh, how many classes have you taught? How many individuals in the neighborhood have you taught? How long have you been a Christian? Have you learned how to teach somebody else about Jesus and why you're a Christian and how to become a Christian? That is the responsibility. Uh, it ought to be the life's passion of every one of us. If we understand what salvation is, that would drive us to fulfilling the commission of preaching the gospel to everyone who will listen. For everyone who uses milk, the writer continues in Hebrews, is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Some of us would be embarrassed if put to answering that question publicly. Have you got your senses exercised to discern both good and evil? Are you of full age spiritually? We need to be. Uh, Christians were being scolded for not being in that condition. And again, our brother Peter wrote, in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. That's not a suggestion, brethren. <laughs> That's an admonition from the apostle of Jesus Christ. How do you make the church strong? You begin by filling it with a knowledge of God's word. And then you make it strong in faith. Faith is belief, conviction, commitment. Uh, we believe what we read and we begin to build a life upon it. Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica, to our brothers and sisters, to people just like us. He said, we're bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it's meet, because that your faith grows exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other abounds. Would he write that of us? Would he write that of any church that we know in the world today, or in our experience, in our country? That's what Paul commended the church for in Thessalonica when he was alive, that's clearly what God wants the church to be. To the Roman church, whom Paul had never met, uh, he wrote this by way of instruction in chapter um, 1 of Romans and beginning in verse number 5. We have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom all ye also the call of Jesus Christ to all that be in Rome, Beloved of God, called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Now, admittedly, they were in the capital city. And word would spread from there to everywhere. But to the church in Thessalonica, in the second letter, he wrote very similar things. That people all around them and even in the next provinces over understood their faith, had heard of their faith. How far has the faith of the church in Selim spread? Or uh, for those of you who are from other places or those of you who have visited other places, how far has the faith of that church spread? Do, do, do other people know us outside of our own little circle of a personal experience close to home? Brother Nichols suggested we need a daring, venturesome faith. That is, we need to be 
bold to reach out. We need to dare to stretch out and to go out to other people. We need to venture forward into the lives of other people and introduce them to Jesus. We need to have the kind of faith in Jesus that we know it's the right thing to do regardless how other people respond to it, regardless what anybody else thinks about it. We need to have that kind of strong faith. How do you make a whole church strong? You make individuals strong in faith. And then the third place, how do you make the church strong? You cannot do so without you saturate it with fervent love. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 22, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. You know, we, we live in a community, we live in a society in America today, in North America, in the Western world, in which, you know, we take people for granted. I've often said, and maybe you've heard me say, that, that uh, you know, we live in an age today in which most of us don't even know who our next door neighbors are. Some of us remember a time in our earlier lives when we knew not only who our neighbors were, but we knew just about everything that was going on in their houses and in their families, extended families. We knew one another. We were a community. And I've often said that one of the things that changed that was central heat and air. We closed our windows so that we don't talk, you know, we don't talk through the windows and hear one another up and down the streets anymore. Uh, automatic washers and dryers. We don't hang our laundry out on the back line anymore where we used to talk to our neighbors while doing so. Uh, now if we out mowing the grass and not hiring somebody else to do it, the best we'll do sometimes maybe is a wave across the way. And we just don't communicate as much as we ought to. And that, unfortunately, has found its way into the church. We just don't spend time knowing one another personally. We don't get to love one another because we don't even stop to think about another person's individual life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you know, we call that the chapter of love. That is not set in the Bible out of context. It's in a broader context. Love is set here in contrast to the miracles that they were doing so that they wouldn't become uh, overly exalted by the fact that they were able to do miracles. Paul says something much, much better than that is love. But here's how he described the love that the church ought to have in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity or love, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Just a lot of noise. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains... I have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profits me nothing. Charity suffers long and is kind. Charity envies not. Charity vaunts not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never fails. But we've got to build it. We've got to work on establishing it, creating it in our hearts, in our lives, for one another. How do you build, how do you make the church strong? You saturate it with fervent love. But also, keep the church unspotted from the world. That's James's admonition in James chapter 1 and verse number 27, pure religion and undefiled. Is that the kind of religion that we want to have? Or would we rather have an impure and defiled religion as we stand before God? Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Do you keep yourself unspotted from the world? Or do you let the world turn you into its kind of mold, make you look like it does? You know, we get so concerned when people don't like us. And, you know, we're, oh, you're just so different, and, and we, want to don't, we don't want to be different, you know? One of my favorite funny lines in a movie is when, uh, I've forgotten who it was that spoke to her, uh, said, I think it was, um, well, can't call his name, Ryan O'Neill. Ryan O'Neill, O'Neill, Ryan O'Neill said to Barbara Streisand, you're just different. And she said, well, I know, and I'm sorry. From now on, I'm going to try to be the same. 
And he said the same as what? She said the same as people who aren't different. <laughs> and that's the, way, that's, that's the way we are. We don't want to be different. We just want to be the same as other people because we let them make us feel uncomfortable if we're different. We ought to feel uncomfortable if we're different from the way God wants us to be. Keep ourselves unspotted from the world. Paul, to the brethren in Rome, wrote in chapter 12 in the first two verses, I beseech you, brethren, we might say beg you, I'm pleading with you, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not transform, or be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What a powerful admonition that is. That's something that most uh, members of the Lord's Church today would do well to uh, hang up on the wall someplace as a reminder every day to present our bodies a living sacrifice. What does that mean? Well, you know, we don't slaughter ourselves and lay ourselves up on the altar in Jerusalem, but sacrifice that community, sacrifice that oneness with those worldly people out there who want to change us into their image or keep us in their image. Don't be conformed, shaped with, made like the world, but be transformed, shaped over into something else away from the world, following Jesus Christ and his example. How do we keep the church strong? Keep it unspotted from the world. And here's one that I pray about every single day. And the church of our generation needs to be, uh, have the zeal restored uh, that we had, or that our brethren had, in the first generation of the church. How do you make the church strong? You fill it with zeal and Devotion. We were reading this morning from Revelation chapters 2 and 3. I want to turn back to the third chapter again and begin in the 14th verse of chapter 3 in the Revelation. To the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and I have need of nothing. And you don't know that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel you, buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich and uh, and white raiment that you may be clothed and, that sh uh, and the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and, the, uh, and anoint thine eyes with eyes said that thou mayest see as many as I love I rebuke and chasten be zealous therefore and repent I think that passage very well describes much of America today we're a proud people we think we've got it all together we don't need anything because we've got good jobs we've got good bank accounts we've got you know nice clothes to wear when we go out we got okay friends that we keep company with, and some of them may be high-placed in the world. We just don't need anything. And Jesus said, you're blind and you're naked and you don't even know it. We need to turn back to him and see the, the devotion that he requires of us. Or John chapter 2, in verse number 13. He shall have judgment without mercy who has showed no mercy. And mercy rejoices against judgment. But what does it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he has faith and have not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto him, Depart in peace and be warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give to them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead being alone. I think I quoted there from 1 John chapter 2. Give it... How do you make the church strong? We need to be a people of more zeal. We need to put some fire in our lives and uh, be devoted to the Lord rather than to our own view and our own way of doing things. We need to be people who are devoted to the word of the Lord, the instruction of the Lord, and the will of the Lord, and doing what he requires us to do. But as is true in most areas of life, the way you make the church strong is to give the church good leadership. 
It's oftentimes said that no organization from the family on out will ever rise above its leadership. That's not necessarily universally true, but it certainly is a maxim in most instances. Elders, deacons, song leaders, class teachers, parents, preachers, right on down the line, need to be people who are devoted, dedicated to God, zealous for God. You cannot lead where you are not going. And if you're following someone as a leader, it's a real good idea to know where he's going. And if the person is not leading toward God, uh, then we ought to turn in some other direction. 1 Timothy chapter 3, almost the entire chapter is given to the qualifications for leadership amongst elders and deacons in the church. In Titus chapter 1, again, we have the qualifications and the purpose of elders. In Acts chapter 20, we have specific instructions to the elders regarding their obligation to God as leaders in the church of Jesus Christ. How do you make the church strong? Well, give it good leadership, but also see that it has a united membership no factions, no bitter contentions, no strife. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, Paul said, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. I deal with preachers across the nation and around the world every day. And I hear so many of them come to me and ask for comfort, ask for advice, ask for instruction. The church has got this mess or that going on. we got this fuss and that. How do we deal with it? All over this country, there are churches that are infested with people who don't even know what the church is. And this is like my little pond, and I'm going to be the big duck on the pond, and you're going to do things my way. And somebody else on the other side of the aisle says, no, 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 it's my pond and I'm the big duck. And then you got a big fight on your hand. you got a squawk fest going on. And that's what's happening in many, many churches. That's not the Lord's church. It's not supposed to be that way. In Acts chapter 4, remember the example that was set by Barnabas and some others when uh, the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. And nobody said, hey, this is mine, you can't have it. And if a brother had need of something, I mean a, a, a real need, and I've got plenty, I've got six suits in my closet, and you just you, you don't have but one to wear, and what are you going to wear if you're laundering that, see? And so they just shared what they had. Barnabas stood out in that regard. Of course, there were people who abused it, and we, we read recently uh, from uh, Acts chapter 5, and we saw how that turned, uh, you know, some people tried to turn a good thing into uh, personal profit, and it didn't work out too well for them, uh, but uh, nevertheless, God's pattern is a good one. And then in Ephesians chapter 4, with all lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. In those churches that I mentioned a moment ago, there are very few who are trying to keep the unity of the Spirit. I don't care about unity. I want everybody to do things my way. I'm going to be the boss here. There's no lowliness in that. There's no meekness there. And there's certainly no long patience with others. And there's no forbearing. That is to put up with somebody else. And why? Because we love them. That's the characteristic of the church. We need to have Christians who are united in membership and not having any of this bitter selfishness that goes on in so many places. To the Romans, the Apostle Paul wrote in chapter 16 and verse 17, I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you've learned, and avoid them, for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. You see, there'd be a lot less of that going on if we go back to step number one and fill the church with the knowledge of the Word of God. We wouldn't be simple-minded in that regard, and we couldn't be deceived if we were all well aware, well informed of the Word. But unscrupulous people who want to have their own ways take advantage of situations in which people are simply unaware or uninformed with regard to the Word. The Old Testament prophet said, my people are destroyed for lack 
of knowledge. And so now we've got the two factors working against one another and destroying the church where the church ought to be strong. So see that the church has a united membership standing against error because it is well informed with regard to the word. Well, there are many other things which are sure to help strengthen the church and the list goes on and on. Offer plain Bible preaching. Just the plain, simple truth. When uh, Paul and Barnabas came to Iconium, they so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. They spoke clearly. My favorite definition of preaching the word of God is found in the Old Testament. In Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse number 8, they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused the people to understand. And that's exactly what Paul and Barnabas were doing here. They so preached that people could understand and believe what they were saying. Paul instructed Timothy later on, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine or teaching. That's what the church needs. No church will grow in Christ that is not fed a steady, constant, a constant and consistent diet of truth boldly and lovingly preached. In Acts chapter 2, from the very beginning, the church continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, breaking of bread and prayers. They all stayed in the teaching of those apostles. They didn't wander off into different doctrines, but they listened to that kind of preaching. In Ephesians 4, verse 15, the church is encouraged to be speaking the truth in love and growing up into all things which is the head, even Christ. That's not written to preachers. That's written to Christians, the whole church, to speak the truth in love. We all need to be doing that. We can build up the church and make it strong by making it a friendly church. Even the Old Testament a book of Proverbs, written by the wisest man who ever lived on earth other than Jesus himself, wrote, a man that hath friends must show himself Friendly. And there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother, Proverbs 18 and verse 24. Sounds like what Jesus said, doesn't it, in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12, what we call the uh, golden rule. All things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. In other words, this is the fulfillment. This is what God's word has always been trying to tell you to do kindness and goodness to other people. And they will be that way to you. Be friendly people everywhere you go. Not just to one another, but to everybody that you meet. We can make the church strong by being a prayerful people. A praying membership in the body of Christ. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17 says, pray without ceasing. That is, don't ever give up the habit of prayer. Be constant in your prayers. In everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Shame on us for not stopping to pray to God before we undertake any activity in the course of the day. You're just going off your daily exercise routine. You know, Lord, I'm thankful that I can get up and do this. There's some folks that can't, you know, and pray to God, you know, that it will be a, uh, you know, a, a safe and healthy exercise routine. You won't strain a muscle or, or break a bone or something. Always be people who are giving thanks to God and praying about everything all the time. In James chapter 5, of course, is a familiar passage that says we ought to be praying for one another that we may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Do we believe that promise? Do we believe the word of God? He says if you pray fervently, you're praying effectively, it's going to accomplish a great deal. God's going to be listening to that. You need to be people who pray regularly. And then to we make the church strong, believe it or not, by being a cheerful giving group of people, liberally giving to the work of the Lord. Second Corinthians chapter 9 is one of the passages that we know well that speaks to this. Every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Second Corinthians 9 and verse number 7. Of course, chapter 16 of the first letter and the first three verses are probably even more familiar to us. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I've given order for the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. For on the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him. That there be no gatherings when I come, and when I come, 
whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, then will I send to bring, <clears throat> what? To bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. Paul anticipated that Christians were going to give cheerfully, lovingly, and uh, liberally according as they were aware of how God had blessed them. And then we want to fill the uh, church with personal workers who above everything else long to win souls for Christ. I don't know how you can really see a church grow into what God wants it to be. Certainly how you can see a church grow numerically without having Christians, members of the church, across the building from the front to the back and the left side to the right side uh, who are out trying to bring souls to Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 8, the whole church was scattered from the city and they that were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Isaiah the prophet had said, We will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law. When they went out of Jerusalem, they went out taking that word of God with them everywhere. You ought to know this passage well. Probably you do. Proverbs 11 and verse 30. The fruit of righteousness is a tree of life. If there's righteousness in your life, it springs up to eternal life. But look at the last half of the verse. And he who wins souls is wise. I heard a preacher the other day or several years ago say, and he who does not win souls is otherwise. <laughs> Well, that's what the Lord said. He who wins souls is wise. What about the guy who doesn't? It's not a wise thing not to be out preaching the word, passing on to others what was passed on to us and save our souls. How do you make the church strong? The list goes on and on. Certainly you cannot make a strong church without keeping the worship assemblies scriptural and spiritual. In uh, 1 John chapter 4, Jesus addressed that topic, didn't he? In verses 23 and 24, The hour comes and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship him. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And we've talked about that often. The truth part is, what does the book say that we ought to do in worship? How is God worship. We get the truth from the Bible. We do what it says. But we also must worship in spirit. We've got to mean what we're saying. Mean it deep down in our hearts and give that thought and that word to God every moment of our approaching Him in worship. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. It's a shame for women to speak in the church. He's talking here about the, the rightness, the, the truth. Uh, and, and there are many other passages that we could have looked at. This is just the one that he put in his outline uh, here. And in some cases, that's a real problem. Especially today, more and more we see uh, people saying, well, you know, a woman's as good as a man. No, she's not. She's a whole lot better than most things. And I think most, most of the men in here will admit that fact. But that's really irrelevant, isn't it? What does God want us to do when we come together and worship? Who are those leaders that must be godly that we talked about a while ago? Well, they must be the husband of one wife. <laughs> and so he's talking to the men. God wants the men to be the leaders in the worship and do the preaching and the teaching and the other things that lead his people in worship. That doesn't mean that the women don't worship. Every Christian bows before God and worships him in spirit and in truth. But we must keep our worship scriptural at all times. And we must keep our worship spiritual, or it is not worship. It's only going through the motions. You make the church strong by saturating it with a forgiving and loving spirit. We've already talked about loving one another. But look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32. Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Did God ever, did you, did you ever see Jesus walk up to those who wanted to follow him and say, well, you got to, you know, who are you, you know? I don't like your attitude. I don't like your personality. I don't like your plans and thoughts and ideas. Where's the kindness? Where's the, where's the love? Jesus showed compassion on the people, even who were trying, or who were uh, killing him and those who were supporting him were doing so. Christians are kind and loving and tender-hearted people. You make the church strong by filling it with godly parents. You might make the church strong today without that, but you aren't making the church strong tomorrow or in the long run without godly parents. In Proverbs 22 and verse 6, of course, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. 
But in Genesis chapter 18 is one of my favorite passages with regard to parenting. In verse number 19, God says concerning Abraham, I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. God is going to bring upon Abraham that which God has spoken of Abraham because Abraham is going to teach his children and his generations after that, and they're going to keep the Lord, keep the, the, the faith, keep the way of God. Does God know you? You better believe he does. Jesus even said, you know, the church in Laodicea a while ago, we read it, I know your works. You're neither hot nor cold. He knows the good things about you. He knows the bad things about you. What would God say about you and your parenting and your example to others around you? In Ephesians chapter 6, that familiar passage in the New Testament says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee that thou mayest live on, long on the earth. We talk, talk about those first three verses. We teach those to our little children. The, the obligation is to the children. But how are children ever going to learn to do that just because a Bible class teacher says it to them once in a, once in a quarter maybe or once a, a week even? Look at the next verse, verse number four. And your fathers, and, why is that word in there? And your fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Don't you know that if we had fathers fulfilling that obligation, that admonition, it wouldn't be a real problem to see children obeying the admonition of the first three verses. If parents are what they ought to be, children will be what they ought to be. And then Brother Nichols suggested to us that we ought to put great emphasis upon the importance of having a good and efficient Bible school. It's estimated that between 80 and 95 percent of the additions to the church, in many places at least, are first enrolled in the Bible school. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verse number 10, excuse me, verse number 2, the Apostle Paul said, The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou unto faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. The church perpetuate itself, perpetuates itself by teaching one generation after the next after the next. We not only teach people the truth, we teach them how to teach the truth so that the truth is taught from one generation to the next. And uh, Brother Nichols suggested that we ought to provide adequate facilities, a meeting house, a classroom, maps, visual aids, blackboards. Blackboards? <laughs> well, young folks, we'll explain that to you later. But that's what he said. Uh, charts and all the other kinds of stuff. Yeah, go ahead and put computers and projectors in there. Whatever gets the message across in the minds of the people. Provide and train a core of first-class teachers for all departments. How much training of teachers do we do in the church in our generation? Not very much. We just beg and plead for somebody to go fill the teacher's chair uh, very often without giving them any kind of training and support and encouragement. Keep adequate records so as to stay in touch with every pupil in every class and let the teacher know, uh, show the same diligence in watching after his class that the elders show over the whole church. One of the ways, certainly, in fact, maybe... Uh, certainly a foundational way to keep the church strong is to keep all the members at work. Give everybody something to do. Don't allow anybody to bury his talent. A working church is a happy church and a growing church. In Nehemiah chapter 4, when Nehemiah led the Israelites into rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem, the people had a mind to work. When the people wanted to work, they got together and they did the work. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, We are created in Christ Jesus unto good works, and God has ordained that we should walk in them. We weren't saved to sit on a padded pew in an air-conditioned building two hours a week. We were saved to do good work in the community. Put them in mind to be subject, Paul says to Titus, the preacher, to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, obey the law, but also what? Do good works. Oh, be ready to every good work. And then in chapter 2 of the same letter, he said, God uh, is gonna, uh, uh, has redeemed us so that we can be zealous of good works. That's what Jesus wants. That's what he died for. Are we zealous for good works? In 1 Timothy chapter 5, uh, people, uh, uh, the, uh, the widows that were to be taken into the number were to be people well reported of for good works who have diligently followed Every good work in Titus chapter 3 and verse 8, looking at those who have believed in God that they might be careful to maintain good works over and over. Look how many times he's encouraged us to be involved 
in good works. Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 10. That you might walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. What's pleasing to the Lord? The life you live, uh, fruitful in every good work. And increasing in the knowledge of God. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 16, Paul prays that, we would, that God would establish us in every good word and work. In uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse number 17, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded or trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us all richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. So it's not only the average or the poor, but it's the rich. It's everybody in the church. And let us consider one another to provoke one another to love and to good works. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 24. I found it interesting in this book from which I took this outline that Brother Nichols did not print a conclusion in this, uh, in this book to this particular outline. And so I found this and I want to offer this as a conclusion to this article which I think is helpful in understanding the heart of Brother Nichols and the work of the church which he describes in this lesson. The article is called The Power of One, and I took it from the Winfield Newsletter, volume 21, number 14. During the war between the states, a young woman learned the truth and obeyed the gospel. Her sweetheart, J.H. Halbrook, was a Confederate soldier. He was captured by the Union Army and kept a prisoner and, and was kept a prisoner in Michigan until the war was over. He was given a ticket to Nashville, Tennessee, and $2.50. From there, he returned to Centerville and found what was left of his home and family. He found his girlfriend, and they were married. His wife studied the Bible with him, and he soon became a Christian. He thought, he, he thought the truth was so good and so simple that he began to teach and baptize many of his friends, many of his neighbors. He began to preach, but he recognized his need for more training, so he came to the original Mars Hill Bible School, taught by T.B. Larimore. Upon completing his studies there, instead of going back to Tennessee, they moved further south, coming to Walker, Marion, Fayette, and Lamar counties in Alabama. One of his many converts was Charlie Alexander Wheeler. His wife taught him to read from the Bible. Along with his wife, C.A. Wheeler obeyed the gospel and soon began preaching to others. He started more than 100 congregations and baptized more than 6,000 people. But wait, the story is not ended. One of those 6,000 was my father, the late Gus Nichols. 12,000 were baptized under his preaching. Among those baptized by Gus Nichols, no one knows nor can know how many began to preach the glorious gospel of Christ, 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4. But I personally know several. I, Flavel Nichols, am one whom he baptized and whom he encouraged to preach the truth. And under my preaching, about 3,000 have been baptized. A few among them preach the gospel also. Only eternity can reveal the total results of the conversion of that one girl nearly 150 years ago. The results are not all in. But this shows that 21,000 people have become Christians through this single thread and fabric of her influence. Go and do likewise, Luke 10, 37. You are important too. Dear reader, if you go to heaven, others will probably be saved by you. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or what knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is heaven, Matthew, in heaven, Matthew 5 and verse 16. Each one is important. So what might happen if you teach someone the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ? And in which of the 17 points we've considered tonight do you need to improve in order to make the church strong? What good reason could there be not to commit yourself to making that improvement? Where do you need to start? You need to start by believing that Jesus is the Christ? Probably not. You're already there and have been for a long time. Do you need to start by repenting from sin? That may be the case in some of us. How about in confessing your faith in Jesus? That may be the case in some of us. Surely must be. How about in being baptized into Christ? Is that your need? Why not tonight? 
But what about those of us who have taken those steps long ago? Have you erred from the truth, James 5, 19? And do you need to come back and give your zeal, your dedication, your devotion to Jesus and be a better example of him as the world looks at you from this day forward? Won't you come to Jesus while we stand for the same? So